Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the B Movies Podcast, your adorable pig for all the latest movie news, reviews, and whatnot. And today on the B Movies Podcast, we've got writer, director, actor, composer, and just about everything else, Shane Carruth. His latest film, Upstream Color, it's the best film about true love, pigs, and mind rape you will ever see. Check it out. Water before you is somehow special. It is better than anything you've ever tasted. Each drink is better than the last. Take a drink now. Yay! Yay! Thank, thank, you, thank you for you. joining us, sir. We appreciate it. Thank you very it. much. So both of us have seen Upstream Color right Indeed. now. Indeed. I think both of us really liked it a I, lot. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Rather, rather immensely. Uh, and I think both of us had the same question. Uh, what, what the, the hell? Yeah. yeah, what the fuck? Here's a film that goes from a very simple uh, sort of visual route, the idea of these sort of parasites that are used as drugs, and then it expands into something more, I think, symbolic and more, you know, kind of deep than just the plot. Yeah. So I don't know, wh- how do that you... Sounds great to me. So that sounds great to see it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Do you start with a big idea in here, I want to do a story about the interconnectivity of things or, or true love, or do you start with something simple, like you have an idea for this parasite that unites people subconsciously? Um, it's, the, it's the first. It's, um, the, I, what I needed is to have, a, have some central characters that I, I tear down their, their identity and their personal narrative so that we can force them to rebuild it. Uh, like the central character, um, Chris, played by Amy Simon, she's, when she's stripped of, of who she thinks she is, she becomes sort of a raw nerve. And so I can yeah. start to use other things that are affecting her at a distance it puts her in a state where she has all of the emotion and hysteria, uh, but nothing to point to as the culprit. Um, mm-hmm. And so it, it, it bleeds into this exploration of, of identity and how it all works. And, um, you know, that's, that was the starting point. And then all of the other weird elements are there to support that. Now, but the way you describe it now, it sounds like it could have been almost any traumatic incident yeah. that strips mm-hmm. her of her identity. W- at what point in your head in the creative process do these worms come in? Were those based on guinea worms at all? Or, no, or where well, do I mean, those come from? Like, you're right. It could, there, there probably are a bunch of ways into that. Sure. Um, but in my mind, they would all potentially be too specific. Um, like, for instance, if it was... If it was a pharmaceutical drug that was on the market, then um, It'd or be a comment on pharmaceuticals. Exactly, then. and yeah. so anything too specific becomes oh, it's it's an indictment of whatever that thing is. Mm-hmm. This needed to feel universal because we're talking about all the different ways that um, that that a person can feel like their experiences is being or their subjective experience is being altered and 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 all of that. So I needed to come up with a construct that wasn't any of those things and mm-hmm. that was potentially. Um, uh, embedded in the place that we live, just outside our experience, that it's long lived, that it's been around as long as we have, that it's cyclical. It needed to fit all of this criteria, um, and so that's where that's why it goes to the natural world. Um, yeah. And you know, so all of these elements, these worms, pig, orchid things, um, that's uh, that's just that's that's my way to satisfy that. There, there's a lot of references in the film to uh, Walden, Henry David Thoreau, and you know the, the sort of connection to the natural world, which I, I thought was really appealing. Uh, there's a few things. Mm. Oh, he doesn't, oh, now he gets Yeah, there you go. There's a few things. Um, I wanted him to go off, but I think we're getting into like <laughs> meat and substance of it. The film is trying to communicate in a lot of different mm-hmm. nonverbal ways. It's using yeah. you know soundscapes and music and um, cinematography and a, a tactility to the cinematography. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of parallel imagery as well yes. as sort of create connections almost subconsciously yeah. between different people. Right, yeah. and some of that language is represented in in weird bits of prose that you could that you could grab from Walden. It's it, there's a ton of language in there about mm-hmm. the way that sound works at a distance and sound underwater, which we have a lot of. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of uh, uh, imagery having to do with light so you know after a while it just became cemented that okay here's a here's a way into this story um, that that sort of satisfies everything it needs to be is there something about a narrative that you just like to stay away from the, the movie's telegraphing that it's about something like mm-hmm. that much is that much is clear um, and I think more or less people get the plot they get what's going on mm-hmm. but everything is not sewn up by the end credits as far as what all that meant. Right. I, I feel like there's an emotional arc that's, that's pretty satisfying. I feel like there's a narrative that people are able to repeat pretty much beat by beat as they walk out, but there's still that, that missing piece of, okay, well, great, what, was, what did all that mean? And to be honest, 
that's pretty much where I want to be when I leave a movie. Mm -hmm. I don't want to mm -hmm. know everything. I want to. I want there to. I want to have enough confidence, and I want to be shown that there were there was enough um, meaning that I got out of it to know that the rest of it was probably poignant as well. Mm -hmm. And then I want to go have a conversation, or maybe I want to see it again. Um, or that's the audience I'm writing for. It's it's meant to be something that is hopefully good enough to be dwelled on and then potentially revisited. My favorite works. Um, I find that I enjoy them more and more the more I see them. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, that's my hope. That's my hope for this, I guess. In Primer, you, you did something similar where you, you let the plot be as complex as possible and didn't really, you didn't hold the audience's hand. Yeah. You, you, and, but in, the, in Upstream Color, though, it's less about the plot and more about the thematic underpinnings. Right. Was that, was that difficult? Was one of those more natural for you? To... Um, no, it just seems like whatever was appropriate to the story. Um, yeah, it's, that's what's so funny is here's two movies that are uh, challenging. Maybe that's a nice word. I think it's a very nice word. They're I think it's challenging, nice word. but in different yeah. ways, um, and necessarily so. In, in Primer, you know, things have to be complicated because we've got two characters that are losing users, the thread yeah. of what is yeah. happening, and that's part yeah. of why they're suspicious, and that's what causes them to do the things they're doing. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's necessarily complex. You know, Upstream is necessarily complex because we've got characters that are affected by things they can't speak to. It makes a certain sense, but I think there are certain connections that are not entirely made explicit yeah. throughout the film. Tell, tell me about sort of structuring that and putting that together. Yeah, I mean, these characters are waking up in a moment, and they look around, and it looks like they must have done these things, and they can't quite atone for why they would have, and so they have to adopt whatever makes the most sense, whatever reasoning makes the most sense. And both, you know, Chris and, and Jeff, as, as the central characters that we see this happen to, um, they both come to a different conclusion as to why they would have done that sort of thing. And then, at that point, end up having to live that version of themselves. There's some tension to that uh, constantly being suspicious that something about this is not playing out correctly. Something about yeah. this is just wrong, but not being able to speak to exactly what about it it is. Yeah. That's a fertile place yeah. To, to, to get mm -hmm. into how narrative works, or personal yeah. narrative works. This isn't fun, taking yeah. somebody's version of themselves away. It becomes mm -hmm. really horrific the more you do it, the more layers you peel back. Yeah. I think I expected to come to some conclusion, or maybe I had, I just believed, uh, without, without knowing it, that if you started pulling back all of these layers of what a person could be, you know, all of their beliefs and, and political beliefs, religious beliefs, emotional connections, you know, reasoning for why they did what they did and why they'll continue to do, all of these things, that I thought maybe, okay, there'll be a core though, there'll be something deep underneath, and then that will be that person, mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll branch out from there if we regrow it or whatever. And I think what became really horrific for me was the idea that, well, what if you pull these layers away and there isn't anything underneath, and that everything is just these layers? I think that was actually the moment that I put everything aside and, and said, this is, uh, this is now going to be a film that nothing else will happen until this is made. You were working on something before this uh -huh. uh, for what was called a topiary, was yep. that right? Yeah. Um, and I'd read somewhere that that was about some people who had sort of created a creature, something along those lines. I don't want Sure. Yeah. And I saw Amy Simons' character was uh, a film editor and that she was, it looked like she might have been like editing like a scene from a topiary. Was that? That's what that was. That's exactly what that was? Mm -hmm. Was that actual footage that you had put together? Or? It is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I invested a lot of my, a lot of time into that, that project and um, the, the main running time of it involved 10 kids in a rural setting that get a hold of the ability to create um, creatures in, in, a, in a way that they see fit based on these rudimentary pieces. I've got Chris, I wanted to put her in a, in a job that, that involved fiction in some way. I want, I want fiction to be what she's surrounded in from the, from the get-go. And so uh, I had these effects tests and thought, well great, I can sort of use this now for something. Do you still hope to make that at some point, or do you think that's on the back burner for now? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't um, it's not something I'm pursuing or, or can imagine pursuing. It's sort of, yeah. it, I mean, I, I, I really invested a lot of, of time and energy, and so uh, it sort of it just doesn't, it feels like if I pursue it for, for one more day, it's okay. just gonna turn sour, and I just don't want that to happen. After Primer, were the studios kicking down your door? Oh, yeah. Yeah? They're like, please take Iron Man, please take, right? uh, no. No? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm actually surprised. Because Primer, no, I'm actually, I mean, maybe not Iron Man, but you know, the, Primer, I think, I kept hearing about Primer, and I kept hearing, well, you got to see this movie. Were there any opportunities that, that came out of that, or was it just like, no, you go do your own thing, Shane? Um, well, there were lots of meetings, but I think the I think the way that it happens in Los Angeles is that um, even even people that have you know a lot of power, like I, I know some filmmakers that that 
that direct big bigger things. Yeah. But even they, it's not like they get a they get an offer, you know, right. and suddenly, hey, will you please take this? We'll pay you this much. It's right. more like, hey, are you interested in this? And then you've got to prove that you're interested by yeah. coming up with some version of it. So I didn't really ever get to even that point. I mean, whatever was being sent my way. Well, first of all, half of it was time travel stories because right. I'm time travel guy, and um, yeah, clearly. yeah, of course, you're an expert. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I, I really think that what was happening is I don't think any anybody was looking at Primer and going, "Oh yeah, this is the guy. This, <laughs> this is the guy that's going to really make our bottom line." Yeah. Um, I think more or less any meeting I was having was was out of fear uh, mm -hmm. or like what if this guy does turn into being the next guy we sure want to be you know somebody who was his friend from the get go you want to be in the Shanker Ruth business yeah pretty yeah. much um, which is I mean it's fine I was really lucky to meet a lot of the people I met but it's it just uh, I don't know it took a while to figure out that mm -hmm. there's no common ground a lot of people think, you know, okay, you're an independent filmmaker, you're going to make your independent movie, you're going to follow your passions, but what you really want to do, clearly, <laughs> right. is adapt this book, right. or this comic book, or remake this movie. Is there anything like that, anything about that even appeals to you? Like, no. nothing, nothing like, mm -hmm. no? No, if, to be honest, if there's some work out there that I really enjoy and am inspired by, mm -hmm. why would I remake it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't... It's like, I love it, but it kind of sucks, so I yeah, kind of want to fix it up a bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Here's what's wrong with that thing that I love. <laughs> Let me go... Fi yeah, exactly. No. no, I mean, well, yeah. I just... I Fundamentally, I just don't think that that's... It's just... It's basically saying that we don't... We don't... We can't figure out any new stories, or we can't right. figure out any new ways to tell them, and I... I mean, that seems like giving up. I don't know what that is, really. When I'm in an audience, uh, when I'm seeing something, um, and I'm challenged by it, I want to know that if I do the work to pull this thing apart and put it back together and try to make sense of it, I want to know there's something behind it. Um, I, what I don't want to suspect is that the thing that's in front of me that I don't quite understand is only there because it was part of the second rewrite by some group that they hired. Um, and so the works that I respond to the most are the works that are really singular, and um, so that's what I... That's what I'm guided by. What are some, what are some films yeah. that you respond to? The latest is The Master. Um, I've, it's weird. I can't make myself watch any other films or TV shows, really, but I've watched that three times since it's been out. Hmm. Um, yeah, I really respond to that. And then I, I do the really pretentious thing where I, I watch way too much French New Wave, but I just... <laughs> music while I was writing the script um, and that's more about my confidence level because if I if I know what we can do visually and I know a few other things um, and I've got this moment um, that I, I imagine in my head if I can get a bit of music to support that and inform that and it, and it actually works once you sort of squint your eyes and imagine all these things together then I feel great that okay we can get to that moment so let's start we can build on that so that's why it's important to me to be writing the music at the same time um, what I realized as we got closer and closer to production and our visual language was coming into being our visual language I think was doing a really good job of conveying a subjectivity and a tactility and um, a few other things that that was somehow jarring with half of the music I had written and I was trying to figure out why and what it was is I was writing that half of the music was um, it was trying to frame the mind of the audience and not necessarily conveying the experience of the on-screen characters and that's what was that was what was conflicting with everything else. And so I had to toss that stuff out and start rewriting half of it. Are, how, are, how are you looking at the home video release? Are going to have a lot of special features on this, or you think the film was just going to speak for itself? Sort of averse to those sort of things now. Um, and I, I, I almost feel like it's a distraction from the film. They're adding context to the production, and the production is not the film. The film is the final thing that has been mulled over and decided over and over and over again. The film exists. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Um, I've, you know, we even had the option to, you know, print this the script and make that available. But I don't believe that that's the that's not the film either. So to yeah. represent it as if it is is um, sort of a marketing yeah, tactic. Yeah. So. It's been said that the, the better commentary tracks are not made by the people who are involved with the film, but uh, by scholars who are oh, analyzing yeah. the film, yeah. however correct they may be or not. Yeah. So what we're saying is we'll do it. Perfect. So. Awesome. Thank you, so Mr. Shankaruth. Uh, you may pick a pig. Are you yeah, take, a pig, take, take a pig. Take a pig. Whichever please. pig you would like. Well, I'm right now. Everything I own is in a suitcase like this size. Uh -huh, so I got to be careful. Uh, so so you're gonna take, take a little guy. I'm taking this guy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So everyone, check out Upstream Color. Should be in theaters now. And never forget, we're smarter, smarter than, than you. you. And he's smarter than us. I wanna go to the midnight show. I'm sorry.
sorry, what?